Welcome back to the Best PT Podcast. This is episode 3.9, talking about balance in the vestibular system. So balance is a combination of three different inputs, somatosensory, visual, and vestibular. Somatosensory input comes from joints, ligaments, muscles, and skin that provides proprioceptive information, such as the length and tension of muscles, pressure, pain, and kinesthetic awareness. Primary somatosensory centers are in the ankles, knees, hips, and neck. Visual input gives us perceptual acuity regarding the motion of objects around us, the motion of our own self, verticalness, environmental orientation, postural sway, and head and neck movements. Children rely on this system the most during development. Vestibular input provides the central nervous system with feedback regarding the position and movement of our head in space. So inside the vestibular system, we have the labyrinth, which contains three semicircular canals in the inner ear that are filled with endolymph fluid. The canals respond to the movement of the fluid with head motion. Also within the labyrinth, we have two otolith organs that measure the effects of gravity and acceleration and deceleration movement. The otolith organs each have a special name, the saccule and the utricle. On top of these structures, we have the otoconia, which are calcium carbonate crystals. The movement of these crystals helps the vestibular system determine the effects of gravity, as well as the acceleration and deceleration as the weight of the crystals moves around in our head. We have two major balance reflexes. The first is the vestibular ocular reflex, or the VOR. This allows for head-eye movement coordination, the supporting of gaze stabilization, which occurs by maintaining a stable image on our retina during movement. We also have the vestibular spinal reflex, the VSR, that stabilizes the body and controls movement. Automatic postural strategies four different types. We have the ankle strategy, which is usually the first strategy that is used to maintain balance. It responds well to small amplitude, low velocity perturbations. Muscles contract distal to proximally from the ankle to control postural sway. The hip strategy is elicited when a large amplitude and or large velocity perturbation is felt. Hips move in opposite direction as the head, and muscles contract proximally to distally beginning at the hip. The suspension strategy is used to lower the body center of gravity in order to maintain balance. So usually knee and hip flexion occurs to achieve a crouch or squat position. This is used often when both mobility and stability are necessary, such as in sports like surfing. And finally, the stepping strategy is used when we feel an unexpected perturbation that moves the center of gravity outside our base of support. So we step or reach out with our upper extremities or both in order to create a new base of support. Vertigo is the sensation of spinning either of ourself or the environment or both. Two types of vertigo, peripheral vertigo and central vertigo. Peripheral vertigo, short duration episodes, with possible autonomic symptoms such as looking pale or sweating. Nausea and vomiting are possible. Patients report a feeling of fullness in their ears. They report tinnitus or ringing in their ears. Examples include benign paroxysmal positioning vertigo or BPPV, Meniere's disease, infections such as an acoustic neuritis, trauma or tumor, diabetes, or acute alcohol intoxication, which is a nice way to say drunk. Central vertigo. Patients may lose consciousness. They will have neurological symptoms such as diplopia or double vision, hemianopsia, weakness, numbness, ataxia, or dysarthria. They usually do not have autonomic symptoms such as looking pale or sweating. BPPV, a specific type of peripheral vertigo. It's vertigo that occurs due to changes in head position. After the head has moved, the vertigo episodes only last a few seconds. The most common type of BPPV affects the posterior semicircular canal. So in more than 90% of vertigo cases, it is posterior semicircular canal BPPV. 
The cause is those Araucania or ear crystals fall off their bed and get lodged in the posterior semicircle canal. The common way to test is the Dix Hallpike test, which assesses the posterior semicircular canal. And then treatment is the canalith repositioning movement, which works for both posterior and anterior canalothiasis. Nystagmus is a symptom in vertigo that tells us the area of vestibular involvement based on the type of nystagmus that presents. In the outline here, I've got a really nice table that I took from a lecture from Dr. Amy York at the University of Michigan Flint that does a really great job of breaking down nystagmus characteristics and what that tells us about the vertigo diagnosis. So if you see right torsional nystagmus, you know that the right ear is affected. If you see left torsional nystagmus, you know the left ear is affected. If you see upbeating nystagmus, you know the posterior canal is affected. And if you see downbeating nystagmus, you know the anterior canal is affected. If nystagmus lasts more than one minute, it is called cupulolithiasis. And if it is less than 60 seconds, it is canalithiasis. Geotropic nystagmus is beating towards the earth, which is indicative of horizontal canal canalithiasis. And ageotropic nystagmus is beating away from the earth, which is horizontal canal cupulolithiasis. Acquired nystagmus. There are multiple types of acquired nystagmus. Spontaneous nystagmus is a constant drift of the eyes followed by corrective saccades, usually lasting 24 hours or less due to an acute vestibular lesion. Peripheral acquired nystagmus stops with visual fixation, so if the patient fixates on an object, the nystagmus stops. Central nystagmus does not stop with visual fixation. Positional nystagmus is nystagmus such as that found in BPPD. It is nystagmus induced by head movements, which resolves after a few seconds, such as after performing a Dix Hallpike maneuver. And finally, gaze evoked nystagmus occurs when eyes shift to focus on a new position. So this indicates central, central nervous system pathology, such as a brain injury or multiple sclerosis. And finally, we'll finish with some simple balance tests and measures. We have the world-famous Berg Balance Scale, which assesses fall risk. It is mostly valid in older adults. It assesses static activities, dynamic activities, and transitional movements. The Fregley grabial ataxia test battery is best used with high-level patients. It involves standing and walking on beams with eyes open and closed, as well as single leg balance with eyes open and eyes closed. The Fugelmeyer is a balance assessment designed specifically for patients with hemiplegia. We'll talk about the Fugelmeyer more specifically later on in the stroke episode. The functional reach test assesses standing balance and the risk of falling. The Romberg test tests balance in ataxia. The patient stands feet together, arms crossed over their chest, and eyes opened and then closed. You can increase the difficulty by using the sharpened Romberg or tandem Romberg test where you have the patient stand heel to toe with their non-dominant foot in front. The timed up and go test assesses mobility and balance. Less than 10 seconds is considered normal. And then finally the Tenetti Performance Oriented Mobility Assessment or POMA assesses gait quality, balance, as well as transfers. That's it for episode 3.9 discussing balance in the vestibular systems. Episode 3.10, we'll talk about aphasia and communication impairment. As always, the outline will be in the show notes. Thank you for joining.